Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the fifth and final episode of our summer Jumpstart American Job Series. I'm Nancy McLernan, President and CEO of the Global Business Alliance. We are a trade association representing international companies doing business in the United States across a wide variety of industries. GBA advocates for policies to help ensure the U.S. remains the most competitive location around the world for foreign direct investment, which in turn increases American employment and U.S. economic growth. You can find out more about our organization on our website at globalbusiness.org or on Twitter. Our handle is at globalbiz with a Z. GBA has proudly produced this series to share practical perspectives from the private sector at a critical time in U.S. history. Over the past four weeks, we have heard specifics from top executives at 11 companies and 12 trade associations on how businesses have been impacted by the pandemic, are adapting and planning for the future. Today, I've invited all the association executives back so they can share their top recommendations for jumpstarting job growth in America. But before we get to that, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with two executives on how the last six months might impact the future of work in America. Joining me now is Karen Halby, Executive Vice President at Sony Corporation of America. Hi, Karen. It's really good to see you this morning. Likewise, Nancy. Sony's businesses includes everything from music and movies to video game consoles and semiconductors. In many ways, your company represents the complexity of our interconnected 21st century economy. Now, you're a manager of employees located all around the world. So can you give us an idea of how the pandemic has impacted your team? And given that your responsibilities, I know, come with firm regulatory deadlines, how have you all adapted? So our offices and our facilities around the world were closed at various times as the pandemic was spreading globally. In New York, where I'm based, we closed March 13th. And while some of our operations can, can't be performed remotely and had to be completely stopped, such as some of our factories and all of our motion picture and TV production, most of our workers went immediately into work from home environments. And for finance and accounting, the timing couldn't have been worse because we're a March 31 year end and we are entering into our busiest period for the year where we had to finish year end projects and we had accounting ledgers that had to be closed and financial statements prepared and even the financial audit had to be completed. Um, I am pleased to report that we successfully delivered on all of these in a timely manner despite working 100% remotely. I think Sony's well positioned to work effectively in the remote environment. As a large global company uh, with business headquarters located in different parts of the world, the teams are, are, are comfortable and familiar with virtual meetings and navigating different time zones to work together with colleagues. With all of us uh, doing it at once, I was a little worried about whether the IT infrastructure and the VPN would hold out. Thankfully, it did. Uh, and additionally, we had just migrated to Office 365 in Teams, so we all had to learn that on the fly. Unfortunately, colleagues were helping each other and shared tips on chat rooms. With the deadlines we faced, we made sure everyone stayed on the same page, and we obviously couldn't walk around the office to troubleshoot issues. So the leaders they communicated daily uh, so that the team stayed together and issues could be quickly triaged and resolved. So in some ways, it may have been even more efficient than when we worked in the office. But not being in the office means while you stay more focused, the more informal conversations are not happening. And those are so critical to keeping people up to speed, sharing concerns, kicking around ideas, and maintaining the corporate and team culture. Those conversations um, can happen remotely, but unfortunately it requires a formality, and it's important as leaders that we take the time to reach out to the staff one on one to get the additional feedback we need. We can't just rely on group discussions to do that. And during the pandemic, uh, we have been interviewing for open positions. We're still hiring and onboarding new staff remotely. Video interviews take some getting used to, but we did find them effective for getting to know candidates and vice versa. Onboarding the new employees takes a lot of communication and inclusion uh, to ensure that the new person feels part of the team uh, and feels welcome and adapts to the company's culture. And a challenge to train the more junior hires, I worry that they will lose some of those benefits of apprenticing with senior staff, which is hard to do remotely. One of our episodes focused on U.S. manufacturing sector, and we discussed the symbiotic relationship between manufacturing and technology. But I know that technology also plays a growing role in the finance and accounting industry. Can you talk a little bit about how remote work during the pandemic 
has impacted any perhaps long-term trends uh, for professions uh, like those on your team? So finance and accounting was already going through a transformation through the use of technology. Processes were being automated. ERP consolidation systems were being modified to be able to automatically extract data at a more granular level. And robotics were being introduced in areas of data collection and reconciliation. We introduced these automations to help us maintain quality and efficiency as the world, as you know, is become increasingly a complex in finance and tax. The automation projects continue despite our remote working. And I think the benefits of remote working has made people more tech savvy as they're more dependent on it for the day-to-day -day survival. And even those that were resistant to automation are now getting more comfortable with it. Even something simple like e-signatures and, and uh, eliminating paper approval processes happen really fast, purely out of necessity. Unfortunately for us, the tax authorities are not so uh, up to speed yet and are behind in technology. And so many of our processes at the end of the day, even if we're doing them with automation, require a physical tax return to be prepared and actually mailed. So there's been a challenge in the remote environment. But overall, I think that the technology has really helped us succeed in this environment. So I think you know, I have three kids in their early 20s. So I'm really interested in any advice you could offer a college student heading into the job market within the next two to five years? And are there specific skills you think are gonna be particularly valuable? So Sony defines itself as a creative entertainment company with a solid foundation in technology. And thus we believe technology is key to everything we do. So I would advise college students, and I've been advising also my nieces and nephews, to make sure they get a solid background in technology, regardless of whatever vocation they choose to follow, because technology is being used everywhere. And that solid background can be operating systems for financial um, operations or software development or content creation, robotics, artificial intelligence. There's almost no field that isn't using some form of technology and all of those fields are experiencing tremendous and rapid transformation. So students, I think would be well advised to consider how technology can change or be used in their field of interest and invest in learning those skills needed to adapt. Is there anything that you think state and federal policymakers can do to ensure that the kids are going to be well prepared for the jobs of tomorrow? So from a policy perspective, state and federal governments need to focus on training our workforce and investing in education at all levels to make sure that the workforce has the necessary skills and ability to succeed. Older workers may need to be retrained to get comfortable with technology. And we really need to ensure that all children from an early age have access to computers and the internet so that they can develop these skills from the very beginning. And even with the, the way uh, education has been during this pandemic, I think has educated kids very quickly on the use of technology as they're having to do their schoolwork uh, remotely as we are also working remotely. So Karen, thinking past uh, the pandemic and, and what we're dealing with now, what do you see as sort of the long-term impact of all of this will have on uh, the future of work? So while pre-pandemic, uh, we've been testing working from home on a trial basis, but many are with many of our functions, but we hadn't completely embraced it at the headquarters. I think there was a lot of people still sort of feeling a little resistant um, to, the, to the new world of working from home. But when COVID-19 came and forced it upon all of us, uh, we proved that we not only survived, but we, we could continue work without missing a beat. And so now as leaders, I think we need to think about how we want the organizational structure to look after we have the option to go back to the office. And when I talk to some of my employees, they have mixed views. Those with long commutes are finding a much better balance and quality of life, and they're going to want the flexibility in that regard going, uh, going forward. So they may not want to come back to the office five days a week. Others miss the office life, and they mentally need to get out of their homes and be with their colleagues. And firstly, I miss the off-sites and the in-person meetings uh, and the travel that allow a global organization to build strong ties, collaborate, strategize, and resolve tough issues. This new world may change how much office space we actually need and how the space will be used going forward. And this new world will change how we recruit. And it may allow us to find talent outside of our office zone, people who are willing to work remote even for corporate functions. So I think this new world should make global virtual organizations much easier to implement and more effective as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate your taking the time to be with us this morning. 
Thanks, Nancy. It's my pleasure. It's great to see you. And now I'd like to welcome Jeff Joseph, president of SIIA, the Software and Information Industry Association. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Nancy. Thank you for having me. There's been a ton of discussion over how school districts should handle the fall. Should they go all virtual, in person, or some sort of hybrid approach? While the challenges of the pandemic on our educational systems have been widely reported, I'd actually like to flip it on you and mm -hmm. ask whether you believe the pandemic has created any positive opportunities for students, parents, teachers, and school administrators that can improve the quality of our educational system in the long term. Well, I'm going to answer both as a uh, head of an association that represents ed tech companies and as a parent of uh, two school aged children. And the answer is, of course, yes. You know, this has all been so new um, to everyone working in education, um, and we haven't been able, barely been able to come from for air since the uh, pandemic hit. Um, the type of learning that, that happened in the spring was really what we called crisis learning. Schools had to transition from the type of learning we've done for decades to a completely new type of learning over the course of a weekend, in a sense. Uh, and naturally, there are some successes, some hiccups, and some outright failures. But as we transition to the fall season, um, it seems like learning is going to differ from locality to locality. Um, if a COVID hotspot emerges, a school that was in person might have to quickly pivot to 100% virtual. We're seeing, to your point, um, hybrid in some places, some opening fully. Um, but fortunately, schools and educators and parents and administrators and ed tech companies have had the summer um, to prepare a bit more for the uh, ongoing disruptions to instruction and sort of move to, um, to these hybrid or different learning platforms. I think one clear opportunity this pandemic has presented is the um, dire need to support what we call social and emotional learning. Um, students and educators need to feel safe and secure in what they're doing in addition to being challenged academically and professionally. Um, we want to make sure that students are showing up in class and learning, but also doing so in a way where they feel they have the support they need to grow. Uh, an example is students in a face-to-face -face classroom use body language to convey some aspects of their thoughts and feelings and to monitor how others uh, react to them. That's difficult in an online learning, learning environment. Um, but, but while it's difficult to sort of replicate such visual and uh, auditory cues in online um, instruction, um, we can, we've learned a lot. You can use um, emoticons, you can specifically say I'm joking or just, be, just um, use language and use some of the technology platforms and, and, uh, and, and um, tools to, to be able to uh, express yourself in different ways that may be difficult in online platforms. Um, and, and I think that we've worked, a number of the companies have worked to address the challenges that became apparent in the spring. I'm hearing of companies partnering with their customers to address professional development needs, technology support, um, helping uh, kids get connected to the internet. Um, there's so many opportunities now that we've had time to pre prepare. But I guess the last thing I'd say is that, you know, it's not just the platforms in and of themselves that, that need to be addressed. It's not enough. We need um, schools to have the dollars that, that are necessary to purchase the platforms to pivot. We need training for educators. Uh, and of course, we need increased access to broadband and hardware for those students who are at risk and don't have immediate access. Can you talk a bit about how your members are helping to minimize some of the disruptions? And do you have any concerns about the students accessing the technology and digital information they need in this environment? You touched on it a little bit, but I uh, would like you to talk a little bit more about it. Sure. Well, access is a, is a key issue and, and it's a challenge. Um, we've seen some technology companies uh, who had programs to provide hardware expand those programs. Um, we're seeing uh, some um, uh, broadband providers step up and expand their programs. And we're calling, uh, we've joined with a number of associations and private companies to call on the government to expand access to, to the E-rate program um, to, uh, to allow um, um, school districts uh, to provide more support and more access. We're working uh, we see some of our member companies working with uh, localities to provide um, to expand library use um, and to find other locations to bring students who may not have uh, high speed access at home to provide them with a location to do so. Um, so you know, there'll still be challenges and we'll continue to learn more. It's such a dynamic and uh, unprecedented environment, but I've been impressed by the, uh, the, the collaboration uh, between uh, private sector and the public sector in addressing some of these concerns um, and, uh, and, and 
and engaging with parents and with the administrators. Uh, we launched a website um, last spring when this first hit called Tech for Learners. We partnered with the administration and it's a sort of a one-stop online platform where administrators, educators, and parents can go to find solutions to, uh, to address distance learning. Yeah, that's terrific. With over 800 member companies, I know SIIA is the largest association of software and content publishers in the US. So I'd like to talk a bit about intellectual property protection. Your group recently published a letter on IP protections and the generation of AI. Why do you think IP protection is so important to the future of US job growth? And as companies continue to develop and refine AI systems, what should policymakers consider before modifying current IP protections? Well, it's no secret, it's no genius to say that innovation has been the key to US global economic success. Particularly as we've moved from, if you think of sort of development of the, the gig or tech economy, we moved from uh, hardware to connectivity to businesses that were based on that connectivity. And now it's really a, a database economy. Um, as my uh, friend and mentor, uh, CTA President Gary Shapiro says, we have to innovate or die. Um, and intellectual property law was designed to provide incentives for humans to, to, uh, to innovate. Uh, for decades, the United States led the world in the development uh, of technology development and, and IP, while it was focused on manufacturing and lower skilled tech. Uh, but as we all know, now it's a global competition. So it's critical that we get this right, um, particularly as we move into deeper and deeper into AI. Um, and I think when many think about AI, uh, they think of you know, what's in their homes, uh, smart speakers, smart appliances. But it's really much more than that. And the opportunities there are, are much greater than that. Um, our members actively use AI on many fights, um, fronts, from journalism to fraud detection, money laundering investigations, locating missing children, a variety of socially beneficial uses. Um, they use artificial intelligence to help people make use of this increasingly large pool of data sets and invest billions in the, uh, in the development, acquisition, and use of that data. So as we think about um, policy to, to sort of govern AI, you know, I think the first and foremost is, is that great rule of, um, you know, be careful. Uh, uh, um, let's, let's move um, thoughtfully, let's move slowly, do no harm. Um, so first, uh, AI has to comply with the existing statutory requirements and respect for established IP rights. Um, second, I think part of the debate is that um, AI should not be considered an author when speaking in terms of copyright law or an inventor uh, if you're speaking in terms of patents. Um, humans, of course, direct AI or use it to invent, but, but we shouldn't have protection in a patent that reads, for example, you know, use AI to achieve a certain result. It's really about the underlying idea, the underlying technology, the underlying content. Um, and, and I think it's important to remember this, that we're in our infancy. Um, we're still developing. Uh, we, we don't know where this will fully head and what the opportunities will be. Um, and the current IP laws seem to be working for the most part. So we as an association um, encourage policymakers to continue to follow the uh, OECD uh, principles, which again are to take a very thoughtful and light-handed regulatory approach with a lot of collaboration, cooperation, and, and learning. In a previous episode, one of the executives made the point that every business is now a tech company. Some just make products. So the currency of technology certainly is data, and that includes personal data. There's currently a worldwide discussion on protecting personal information. Do you envision the relationship between personal data privacy and the business of monetizing that data will become a point of contention between the US and other nations? You talked a little bit about the, the you know, OECD standards on, on um, the IP protections. Um, and what do you think might be the impact of sort of a patchwork approach across the world uh, in terms of long-term U.S. job growth and entrepreneurialism? Uh, it's a particularly germane discussion as we sit here in the wake of the uh, the uh, executive order on uh, TikTok and, and, and WeChat. And, and I think that it really reinforces the importance of first, I think the U.S. taking a leadership role and developing a, a federal privacy law um, with, with preemption. Um, we can talk about global patchwork, but what's particularly clear is that the current patchwork of state approaches, it, it, it doesn't work. It's not good for businesses. It's not good for consumers. Um, we, need, uh, we need to have a federal law with, uh, with transparency for, for consumers that doesn't handcuff innovation um, and prevent legitimate business opportunities. Um, you know, there, there's, there's 
reasonable business uh, needs in, in targeting and using that data for legitimate purposes. I talked about how some of our member companies use data for, for really important public policy interests. But even on the personal level, uh, I'm a person of color. If, uh, if I receive, if I'm served ads that deal with sickle cell or other issues that may be specifically germane to, uh, to my ethnicity, that's, that's valuable. Um, so we have to make sure that we balance concerns about privacy with legitimate uh, uses and, and, and benefits. Um, you know, I, I hope that uh, that uh, as we move through this global environment and figure this out, that data per se will not lead to um, to tax or, or trade war, war, uh, wars. But it's it's worth noting that um, that we are in conflict with about ten countries currently regarding digital services taxation, um, and, and it really has to do with how companies monetize personal and other data, and, and what jurisdictions should be permitted to tax revenues associated with that data. From our perspective. Um, and we don't necessarily think that every provision in a privacy law is optimal. Um, we didn't think so with respect to, for example, the uh, GDPR, certainly not CCPA. Um, but what's crucial is that companies have access to interoperability mechanisms that, that allow companies to transfer data from one jurisdiction to another. Um, to be clear, companies have to respect the law of the companies in which they operate, um, but they don't necessarily have to store data there. You may be familiar recently with the European Court of Justice's uh, recent ruling known as SREMS II, which invalidated the, uh, validated the EU US privacy shield. Um, and this will impact companies that export personal data outside of, uh, to the US from the EU economic area. Um, the privacy shield is a 2016 agreement, allows companies to transfer that data while adhering with privacy laws on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, under the ruling, flows may continue um, based on um, standard privacy protections built into uh, data contracts, um, but the ruling itself may even threaten the long-term future of the second legal method for data transfer and really leaves up in the air what those protections are for, uh, for legitimate data transfer. So we're calling on um, the EU and the US along with other uh, industry groups to find a way to reestablish um, some reliable, predictable interoperability mechanisms um, so those transatlantic data flows can continue and then can inform um, data flows around the world. During several of the past sessions in this series, we've discussed the other major focal point in America today, institutional racism. And your thoughtful views posted on your website were really spot on, specifically, quote, this cannot stand. We must live up to the moment history has handed us. So I'm going to ask you now for your reaction, your views on America's reaction, and, and how are your members addressing the problem? <laughs> you're, you're really going for the uh, for the easy subjects here, aren't you? Well, look, yep. I, you know, I think one of the things that one of the benefits of, of the current environment, or one of the good things that's come out of it, has been um, it's opened the door to increased conversations and increased awareness, and that's really where understanding and some sort of um, some sort of movement forward can, can begin. Um, uh, when we talk about racism, when we think about systemic racism, when we think about these incidents, too often I think people uh, think about sort of the horrific incidents with law enforcement or the Ku Klux Klan, um, but they don't recognize necessarily that racism is so deeply embedded that, and, and, and it doesn't just occur in, in inner cities or the, or the rural South. Um, you know, I, I, it occurs in day-to-day -day activities. I've shared in, in uh, previous writings of my experiences of, of walking into a room and being mistaken for, uh, not for an association for executive, for someone else, or mowing my lawn in, in uh, suburban uh, Arlington, Virginia, um, and having people stop and ask how much I charge. It's those little assumptions um, that, uh, that may not be as newsworthy or news, news ready as these larger and more horrific incidents, but really to sort of demonstrate how deep the problem goes. Uh, in, in our society. Um, I've been personally touched by the willingness for others to listen and engage, and, and again, that's key. And, and while we can all bemoan the destruction and, and, uh, and, and the sort of taking advantage of the protests, we have to be careful that we don't let that get in the way of the real underlying issues. Um, and, I, and I think my biggest disappointment in the national conversation is those who are, seek to deny um, the experience of, of people of color, of color or people who, who aren't part of the majority society in any way. Um, Ibram Kendi says that the heartbeat of racism is denial, and I think that's, that's really true of uh, any type of bigotry. 
Um, so for, for our association and leading our, our members, the most important thing we can do is make sure that we're walking the walk and not just talking the talk and that we are living up to our organizational values. So we've had open discussion among our staff. We've shared our experiences. Um, we put together an internal working group to make sure that as, as we look at our events, as we look at our hiring practices, that, that we're being as inclusive as, as possible. Um, we uh, we're helping. We're starting to work with our member companies. We just held a webinar on building an inclusive workforce, and we're going to survey our members to to identify the gaps. Where can we really provide some support and uh, and assistance to, to help them through? Um, and then I guess finally, as we think about sort of steps forward as a nation, uh, I think we can look to South Africa uh, as a great model and their work around truth and reconciliation, um, where they brought together um, to discussions to address the wrongs and to share experiences without repercussions to, uh, to the majority of society. Uh, and then we need to look at our education system and make sure that we're encouraging conversations in safe spaces and teaching about the differences. Um, it, you know, this is not just a, a discussion about doing the right thing and what's morally right. It's really about doing the right thing from, for, well, it, it's also about, I should say, doing the right thing from a business and economic perspective. One of our, our great strengths as a nation is our diversity. The greater the, uh, the exchange of ideas, the broader ideas, the better the outcomes. Um, so we really need to, to move forward, to have safe conversations, be willing to listen and share experiences um, so we can move forward. And, uh, and ultimately, this will help us uh, in, our, in, in our competitiveness as well, just creating a better society. Well said, well said. Jeff, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you. But before I let you go, after a short break, I'm going to ask you to kick off the Association Leader Roundup of top policy recommendations for jumpstarting job growth. See you in 60 seconds. Welcome back. As I mentioned at the top, our goal throughout this series was to provide policymakers with key insights from leading private sector executives about the economic impact of the pandemic and perspectives on the path for recovery. To end this series, I've asked all 12 of my association CEO colleagues to come back and share their most important recommendations for jumpstarting job growth in America. Each is sharing his or her own view. It's my sincere hope that policymakers watching today will find these recommendations a reliable roadmap. Jeff, what policy priorities do you believe will best help to jumpstart job growth in America? Well, I think first at the macro level is what we just discussed. We cannot survive economically. We cannot succeed. We cannot move forward until we provide an environment and create a legal and regulatory framework and, and, and a society in which we can tap into the contributions of all Americans. We have to deal with this history of racism and exclusion so that everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed and that small business, businesses, large and small, can, can uh, access the best and brightest, no matter their gender identity, their ethnicity, um, their, their, their country of origin. Um, we need to move there. Um, secondly, uh, we, we need to finalize um, support for those who are in need. Again, we can't move forward. We, we have to provide support for those uh, who are living at the margin so they can contribute to, to economic growth. And, and it means more, that it's, it really needs a comprehensive approach. We have to think about what it means for childcare, uh, what it means for, for, for our schools, um, transportation issues, um, particularly in, in the face of pandemic. It's, it's, we need to start with providing financial support, but we really need a large comprehensive approach um, to make sure that we're providing that support and structure for all to participate uh, in, in, in economic recovery. And then I think third is skills training. 
we need to make greater investments in, in, uh, in skills training, particularly as we, as we continue to move to a more digitized economy and, the, and we need different uh, skills to compete globally. Uh, and I think that means not just looking at traditional methods of training and education. Four-year universities are fantastic, but they're not for everyone. We have to look at our junior college system. We have to look at our community college system. We need to look at VOTEC programs. Um, again, so we provide, a, a, we look comprehensively to make sure we're making the right investments um, to provide skills training and prepare the workforce um, for the jobs we need today and in the future. Well, the first thing I would say is do no harm. Uh, unfortunately, in our sector, uh, we're seeing a couple of different types of reforms uh, that we think would make it more difficult uh, to grow jobs and develop new medicines uh, to advance the public health. Uh, the first is we've seen in, in the House uh, lawmakers take up a bill, HR3, that would take out a trillion dollars uh, from the industry, allow the government uh, to regulate prices in our sector, uh, which would really have a devastating effect, uh, particularly on investment in sm small biotechs um, that are really the lifeblood of innovation in our space. Uh, secondly, uh, some of the policies that are being put forward that would address the supply chain, uh, unfortunately have the potential uh, to create more harm than good in the near term. You know, we think a, diver a diverse, robust supply chain is a feature, not a bug. Uh, it allows our companies to make needed adjustments and to avoid disruption and shortages. So of course we support uh, any targeted uh, reforms uh, to address problems and, and we wanna see more investment in the United States. Uh, but we're concerned about any near-term constraint on the supply chain that would exacerbate problems by creating disruption, shortages, and, and increasing uh, prices. But on the on the positive, a more positive, proactive uh, front, you know, we have the best innovation ecosystem in the world. We have the best doctors, the best hospitals, uh, vibrant capital markets, symbiotic relationship between small and large companies. Uh, we have a, a framework that allows our companies to collaborate with government and academia uh, and for uh, academic institutions to share in the fruits of any uh, medicine that's developed and commercialized. That's made our innovation ecosystem the envy of the world. So I would just encourage policymakers uh, to continue to nurture every aspect of it, um, including renewing its commitment to intellectual property protections, uh, which are absolutely vital uh, to ensuring continued investment in, uh, in the riskiest medicines, including uh, infectious disease, which we're seeing in the context of COVID-19. So we're not going to see full recovery from the COVID crisis until we have a vaccine in place. So continued focus on bringing down incidences of the virus and an investment in uh, research and development of a vaccine and treatments to ensure that uh, we can get back to normal. Uh, in the interim, it's critically important for governors to recognize that the arbitrary designation of essential versus non-essential businesses in the early days of the crisis is no longer appropriate now that we have a greater understanding of the virus and how to operate within it. So we're asking for, re for governors to move beyond that designation and instead to one of safe shopping. If businesses have the protocols in place to keep their customers and their employees safe, then that should be the way that they're evaluated uh, if additional orders need to be put in place uh, in the future. I think the most important thing that we need to do to jumpstart jobs right now is that the federal government must issue clear and consistent health and safety guidelines to keep workers safe in the manufacturing workplace. Without, as, as one of my CEOs has eloquently put it, this is an economic crisis, but it's a health crisis first. And we want to get back to work, but we want to make a safe space for our employees to stay at work, their communities, their families. And indeed, this economy depends on a safe manufacturing workforce. Tariffs, trade policy, all of that is critical innovation to growth of the U.S. manufacturing sector and the competitiveness of the U.S. manufacturing sector. But none of it's going to matter if we don't have people who are confident that they are going to be safe when they come to work and safe when they go home. Whether the broader economic recovery from the pandemic takes months or years, it's shaped like a V, a V, or a W, is become increasingly clear that costly tariffs will hamper a strong recovery. So suspending tariffs, which to be clear, are taxes on American citizens, will be a fundamental 
part of a strong economic recovery and reinvigoration of U.S. manufacturing and innovation. There's not a minute to waste. We need Congress and the administration to act quickly. Thank you. It's very, very important that we have a policy environment that supports innovation here in the United States. In the automotive industry, we are now in the midst of an enormous transformation uh, from uh, vehicles that we drive to vehicles that ultimately will drive themselves to the digitization of mobility and to removing carbon uh, from transportation and personal transportation here in the United States. We have leadership here in the United States in much of those areas. And what we need to do is create a policy environment that supports continued innovation there. And that also means recognizing the importance of exporting those technologies and those products around the world. If we create an island market, um, we will not be able to grow jobs to create opportunities for Americans. And that ought to be our focus as we go forward. From the point of view of the technology industry, ITI has been very focused on encouraging investment in digital infrastructure. There's one thing we've learned very clearly from the current pandemic, it's that all Americans need access to broadband services and related equipment that enables them to continue economic activity from remote places. And that includes working from home, it includes our nation's students learning from home and uh, related areas of activity. But one thing that is very clear is that there is a persistent digital divide that denies access to critical digital infrastructure to a variety of communities, including those Americans who live in rural areas, including low-income Americans, minorities, and it's just not feasible to continue to grow the American economy without ensuring everyone has access to digital infrastructure. So the kind of programs that we're looking federal government to invest in, to state governments to invest in. We've done them successfully before. A lot of the nation's recovery from the Great Depression came from government infrastructure programs. Now, those were physical infrastructure programs. Today's physical infrastructure programs need to be digital. So we are very focused on encouraging the kind of investment in digital infrastructure that brings broadband facilities, that brings technology access to all Americans, regardless of where they work, or live. And that kind of promotion of activity is really going to help speed economic recovery here in this country. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. So, you know, traditionally, small businesses lead the country out of a recession, uh, and the country needs them to do that again. Uh, that's clearly not happening yet, uh, because things are really tough still at the small business level. Um, when you look at small business in America, and if you take it just in its entirety, um, on its own, it's the third largest economy in the world behind the U.S. overall economy and China. So we are talking about a massive number of businesses and a huge number of employees in America um, that make up this small business economy. Uh, and most of them are really small. You know, the average NFIB member is five to ten employees. Um, and so we have focused our policy recommendations on what our members want. Um, uh, one of the unique things about NFIB is that we take our recommendations from our members. We are member driven. They set our policy and then we go advocate for it. So the things that our members have said they really need is they're going to need a lot of them additional access to the PPP program. Uh, those businesses that are clearly struggling and showing that the economy, uh, their economic improvement hasn't happened yet are gonna need access. Uh, we are very concerned about what happens with the unemployment program, the unemployment insurance program going forward. Congress passed an additional $600 a week uh, for uh, recipients of unemployment to help them get through the, uh, the shutdowns and the pandemic. Uh, we are starting to hear from more and more small business owners, though, that um, that is an issue when it comes to getting workers to come back. So uh, one of our policy prescriptions is that that unemployment insurance uh, going forward, uh, we should have a policy that you can't get more in unemployment than you made in the wages at your job. Uh, that will help balance things out and will encourage more uh, employees to return to work. And then we talked a little bit about a liability protection shield for small businesses. That is crucial that they cannot be held accountable for the actions of their customers that they can't control. Um, and then regulations. Uh, really, Congress uh, and the administration need to stop with new regulations. 
Uh, they need to leave the small business sector alone and let them get back to creating jobs and trying to help lead this economy uh, out of the recession we find ourselves in right now. Uh, so regulatory relief uh, and lack of new regulations on small businesses is crucial uh, to helping them get better. Well, you know, following Brad with his recommendations, I, I think my, my first comment is amen and hallelujah. Uh, because, you know, at, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we represent 3 million businesses. 96% of them have uh, under 100 employees. 75% have fewer than 10 employees. So we are right on the same page with Brad. I'll dig in a little bit deeper about some top recommendations we have for Congress and the White House. Um, with regard to additional financial aid, we know that small businesses need more access to capital. We're insisting though that that relief be targeted and temporary because as Brad had said, uh, the, the quicker that the US government can kind of get out of the way of small business, probably the better off we are. With regards to certainty, and it really is a huge component that doesn't lend itself specifically to a legislative answer, uh, but small businesses need assurances from the federal government that all of these things they are doing to get past the pandemic do not result in steps backwards. And I'm speaking specifically about liability. They're taking the right steps. They're following the local health guidance. They're following CDC guidance. They have to be protected from lawsuits. And last but not least, on the regulatory front, the federal government has got to be in a help you mode, not a gotcha mode. And when you look at the Paycheck Protection Program and the type of red tape that it takes to document how you've spent the money to get forgiveness, the federal government has just simply got to trust the small business and say, you know, we intended for this to be a stimulus. We trust that you spent it the right way, and we are automatically going to forgive this $150,000 loan so that you can direct your attention to rebuilding and thriving instead of getting bogged down in red tape and bureaucracy. So first, the IIB supports some of the recommendations you just heard from NFIB and the Chamber, in particular, automatic or at least drastically simplified process for um, converting the loans to grants for PPP loans under $150,000. Second, in the next package, we're really looking for relief for state and local governments. They have suffered, um, you know, drastically reduced revenues while facing dramatically increased costs because of the pandemic, and it's important that they um, be able to have some uh, fiscal support. And finally, on the regulatory sort of policy front, you know, the United States remains the most attractive business market in the world, and foreign banks want to be a part of that. They want to continue to be able to lend and invest, jumpstart American jobs. And so it's really important that foreign banks be able to participate here on a level playing field with their U.S. counterparts. Um, we're really focused on regulation based on size and risk attributes. From my perspective, um, the food supply chains and everything that's associated with it will remain strong if government works closely with business and and with con their customers uh, to best understand what they need given the situation. We have faced so many unanticipated types of challenges in recent months um, that I think going forward, rather than focus on per perhaps a specific recommendation um, from a policy standpoint, I think the most important thing that government can do is listen carefully to the business community, understand where their challenges are, figure out ways to best help them, and to not only look at it from a federal standpoint, but also what's going on in states and localities. Um, one of the challenges we've had to deal with is really um, addressing this variety and this myriad of uh, patchwork quilt kinds of regulations across the country. So if we can take a, a broad perspective, 
um, look at what's going on around the country and stay in close contact on what the, the regulatory and the legislative environment requires, I think we'll all be able to jumpstart the economy and better meet our customers' needs. Well, I think that uh, to ensure creation of job opportunities here at home, we need to continue to ensure the health of a multilateral economic trading and investment system uh, with U.S. leadership. The U.S. really needs to retain its global leadership uh, position in fighting this pandemic on, on all fronts. This is going to be a long and arduous battle for which there are no quick fixes and where no single country can, can triumph alone. Lack of forceful and vigorous U.S. engagement, including even needed reforms in the U.N. system, risks wasted resources and continued COVID-19 outbreaks and could further delay the reopening of the economy. So I think that the uh, we, we need to stay strong uh, in our international position on, on all this. I would urge policymakers to pursue strengthening, not weakening, the U.S.'s global connections with allies and reject well-meaning but short-sighted initiatives that restrict access to global commerce and end up limiting job opportunities for Americans. Specifically, I hope the Congress will move to pass the Global Investment in American Jobs Act, which is H.R. 7753, a new bill that directs the federal government to explore how our nation can harness the full potential of cross-border connections to generate economic growth in communities across the country. It has been my distinct pleasure to host the Jumpstart American Job Series. I've learned a lot and I hope you have too. Before we close, I'd like to thank Nestle, Allianz, Michelin, Shell, Panasonic, Sony, EMD Serono, and DSM, whose support made this series possible. Have a really great week and thanks for tuning in. Hi everyone, I'd like to take a moment to discuss a somewhat misunderstood piece of legislation passed by the CARES Act. I'm speaking about the Employee Retention Credit, or ERC. For employers in the U.S. who are struggling to manage their workforce during this pandemic, the ERC can serve as an important lever as you try to generate cash and cut costs. If you haven't been able to claim the ERC, let me leave you with three pieces of advice. One, it is not too late. You can go all the way back to March 13th of 2020 to identify qualified wages and claim the credit. Two, if you're an essential business, the recent IRS FAQs should give you some hope as they confirm that you can qualify. And finally, three, if you're a large employer, I realize it can be daunting to isolate those qualified wages, but many are doing it and there is a way to achieve that goal. The ERC should definitely be part of your calculus as you work through this difficult pandemic. We are here to help.